Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, so that's a kind of off mainstream uh, topic, maybe uh, this morning. So Dan has proposed me this title, Use of Neutrinos While Still Learning About Them. And when I was starting working on this talk, I realized that it basically covers everything about neutrinos. So I just decided to select a few uh, pictures, few items about neutrinos as an introduction to, to this talk. And then the main um, focus of my talk will be on reactor neutrinos and possible applications for non-proliferation. OK, so fundamental properties of neutrinos. Um, so that's the basic picture of uh, our standard model now with the elementary particles of matter. Where is the... Uh, so we have 12 elementary particles of matter, and uh, here are three uh, fundamental interactions, plus the gravitation, of course. And the neutrinos are there, three of them uh, associated to the charged leptons. Uh, and they couple only to the weak interaction, meaning that for the neutrinos that we will uh, talk about today at the 1 MeV scale, this is the uh, cross-section for interaction, 10 to the minus 43 uh, centimeters square. So these are obviously very penetrating particles. They can go through the Earth with uh, no interaction. Uh, first consequence is, of course, that, it, uh, that means challenging detection, de detection techniques. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, we can see them also as a kind of unique probes of uh, uh, intense source that we could not reach otherwise because they will uh, escape any kind of source and uh, bring us information about it. Uh, yeah, so a few slides about the neutrino footprints or how do we... Uh, how do we get convinced that they are really there? Uh, of course, you know that this, this problem of the beta decay, if uh, what was observed first by Becquerel and others is the, the emission of uh, one electron when, the, when, a nuclei, when a nucleus undergoes a beta decay. In this scheme, you expect a direct uh, energy, uh, one, uh, one well-known energy uh, for, the, for the electron, and what was observed is this continuous distribution, meaning that part of the energy was escaping uh, somehow. Uh, actually, it took uh, some time to uh, really uh, get sure about this uh, missing energy. Uh, discussing with uh, an old colleague from my lab, uh, I, uh, I got this uh, picture from, uh, uh, from Becquerel in, uh, himself. He used uh, his uh, beta source uh, next to a simple uh, dipole magnet, like a small uh, round box with several slits. And he took the picture as the, the first historic picture where, when he discovered the radioactivity. And you see that actually uh, electron rays are escaping through all the slits. That, that was the first evidence for a continuous spectrum. Uh, I don't know if this picture got forgotten or, or people didn't believe in it, but uh, it took more, uh, 20, 26 more years to really get convinced with the last experiment with, with the calor calorimetric measurement that indeed the mean energy was about half of the, the one we expected. And so something was, uh, uh, some energy was es escaping possibly with the neutrino. Um, so 25 more years later in 56, uh, this guy got the, the first signal in a detector, and uh, so that's a good example of one intense source of neutrino that man can control. This is a reactor, and they use a pretty small detector. We will come back to, to this kind of technique later in the talk. And they could observe up to three, or I would say only three neutrinos per hour, but uh, uh, they could really argue about the background and uh, show that these events were disappearing when the reactor uh, stopped, <coughs> and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this uh, discovery. Uh, another important uh, uh, observation is the, the neutral current process that was uh, first uh, observed in the Gargamel chamber at CERN. This is back in the 70s. Um, here you see the picture. There is nothing coming in. At least we, we do not see anything, any tracks in the bubble chamber. Uh, one electron is recalling pretty fast, emitting Bremsstrahlungs and uh, electron-positron pairs, and no other uh, products. So the interpretation of this uh, picture is uh, the, the elastic scattering of uh, uh, muon neutrino from the beam delivered by CERN in this bubble chamber. 
and we do see only the recoil of this electron. And this is a proof that neutral current exists, and that's a important conse consequence of the Gauche theory formalism of the weak interaction with the uh, theory of, uh, by Fermi uh, for the beta decay. Only uh, charge currents were described, and really the neutral currents is a consequence of the Gauche theory formalism, and that was uh, observed here for the first time. Then one word about the uh, cosmic or solar neutrinos. Uh, the very first guy trying to catch these uh, so, uh, neutrinos from the sun was um, uh, Davis uh, using the uh, old gold mine. And this is a large tank of uh, organic liquid. And he was trying to detect few interaction per, per day. Uh, and then uh, later on, the, in the Kamiokande uh, mine in Japan, they, they came with a very large detector where they could uh, uh, detect the Cherenkov flight induced by electrons struck by uh, uh, the highest energetic uh, neutrinos from the sun. And so the one electron was recording. This is similar to the Gargamel uh, event we were seeing, but with an uh, electron neutrino. And the direction of, of the electron and of the associated sharing of cone uh, is uh, forward. Uh, this is the favorable kinematics. And reconstructing the direction for all events, they could uh, uh, prove that it was following the direction of the sun. And that's the first picture of the sun from deep underground. So it proves that actually the sun really burns because they are uh, fusion processes inside the sun that emit neut neutrinos via the beta plus uh, uh, process. And uh, an, uh, another interesting event uh, st uh, still in this uh, super Kamiokande detector was in 1987, where we had the chance that uh, uh, a supernova uh, exploded uh, not too far from uh, our galaxy. And uh, in super Kamiokande, they could see this 11 extra neutrinos with respect to uh, standard background uh, signal. Within a very short time, this is the time in seconds here, so this is really a big burst of neutrinos that uh, again uh, confirms the, the scenario of the uh, explosion of this uh, star and conversion of massive uh, uh, quantity of, of uh, proton uh, into, into neutrons. And so for this observation of the solar and supernova neutrinos, they, this guy also got the, the Nobel Prize in, uh, in 2002. And last uh, interesting fact about neutrinos, I told you there they were three neutrinos because we associate them with the charged leptons, but why not more neutrinos? Actually, we do have uh, nice information about this number of neutrinos. Uh, first, if you look at the, <coughs> the decay width of the Z boson, so that was an experiment done at CERN, that was with the LEP collider, positrons against electrons. You tune the energy so that you are just on, uh, at the resonance of the, just uh, the, the energy in the, center, in, in the center of mass is the, the mass of the Z boson. Uh, and uh, uh, so the experiment can accumulate millions of, uh, of Z bosons and look at the, at the width of this uh, particle. The width, of course, depends on the lifetime and how many channels are open. You can count everything you know, and at the end, there is a remaining missing contribution to fit the data. And then you try to uh, plug in some neutrinos, two, three, or four, and that's the error bar that the fit gives you. So that's really three neutrinos. We know that there are only three neutrinos that couple to the Z boson that are uh, connected with the weak interaction, and that are lighter than the Z boson. Of course, if there is a very massive neutrino. We won't see it here because the, the decay channel is not open. Another impressive information about the number of neutrinos in universe is this, this wonderful data from the Planck satellite that we got uh, uh, early this year, late last year. <coughs> so what you see here is a, a map of the uh, microwave background from the, that's the, the, the remnant from the, um, uh, the radiation of the Big Bang just before, uh, just at the moment where the, the light uh, wa was able to propagate freely in space. Before that, the, the, the density, the temperature was too high, so the matter was uh, in a kind of plasma state. Electrons and photons were interacting very strongly. When the temperature comes low enough, 
uh, electrons are catched by the protons to form hy hydrogen atoms, and the light can uh, escape freely, and that's what we see now. And of course, uh, people are uh, analyzing this very small uh, inhomogeneity in, the, in, the, in this background. Uh, this color here is uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 level. Okay? It's a very uniform uh, temperature, but now they are able to see very small uh, differences. And uh, this analysis is you look at the different angular scale, you, you look at this difference, these unhomogeneities at different scales. So small L is large scale, like a dipole or quadrupole uh, oscillation in this map. And uh, high L is a uh, smaller and smaller scales. And uh, I won't go into the detail, but basically that's what the uh, Big Bang theory and then uh, expansion uh, uh, predicts. That's a big uh, peak in the, in the um, uh, distribution of these uh, unhomogeneities. Uh, um, and uh, then we have several harmonics that are exponentially damped. And what's nice is that the position of this peak depends how the, the matter and radiation was in equilibrium before the light decoupled. And so what, uh, the position and the amplitude of this peak depends on the number of degrees of freedom, numbers of radiation that was there in the universe bef just before the decoupling. So again, if you start plugging different numbers of neutrinos, you see that the amplitude and the position of this peak will move. And fitting these very accurate data, that's the number you get. So that's really impressive that just looking at the background, uh, this CMB uh, in the sky, you can infer the very uh, accurate constraint on the neutrinos. So uh, I stopped there for the general presentation of neutrinos, but for sure, at this point, we know that neutrinos are there, and they are even the most abundant matter particles in the universe, by far above uh, electrons, protons, and neutrons. Only photons are uh, above in numbers, but uh, I don't see them as a matter particle. They are uh, mediator of the uh, electromagnetic interaction. Uh, before going further in my uh, uh, talk, of course, I, I need to say a few words about neutrino oscillations. <coughs> uh, so that's an idea uh, pointed out uh, first by Ponte Corvo back in the 50s. And what we have is three neutrino states. And if you, if you look at the quantum numbers, they are all the same. Uh, well, there is one electron, one muon, and one tau neutrino. But this is not a conserved quantum number. As far as I know, there is no symmetry that is asking for this number to be conserved. So there is, uh, these three uh, states could mix. And if you have a, a current superposition of these states, you could have this kind of uh, interference phenomenon uh, predicted by quantum mechanics. And when, when these coherent packets propagate, if they have different masses during propagation, the contribution of the three wave packets during, pro during the propagation will evolve. And when we recombine uh, the wave packet to detect the neutrino state, we may observe a change in the flavor of the neutrino. That's the phenomenon of oscillation. So it requires uh, different masses between the three states, so at least two non-zero masses. And since we know that uh, these guys have very, very small mass, actually you can have this current propagation of the wave packets over macroscopic uh, lengths. And that's what we observe in uh, many experiments. <coughs> so this is the basic formalism. Let's assume uh, a neutrino is produced by a reactor. Uh, we will see more in detail, but here we have only beta minus decay from the fission products, so it's pure electronic neutrinos, anti-neutrinos actually. Then we have some propagation until we detect the neutrino, and again we, we must couple this neutrino to the weak interaction and, uh, and uh, uh, tag a specific flavor. Uh, let's assume that we use only uh, beta inverse process, so only the electronic neutrino are seen here. What's happened in between these two, the production and, and detection, is that um, so these electron, muon, and tau uh, flavors, they talk with the interaction when you produce or detect the neutrino. But for the propagation between source and, and detector, what matters are the mass eigenstates, the, the Hamiltonian eigenstates. And there is no reason why these two sets of states are the same. We have the, 
the same trick for the, the quarks, for, in, for instance. There is a mixing matrix between the mass states and the flavor states. So that's what I call the big theta. That's the, the mixing that converts from the flavor to the mass uh, eigenstates. Once you projected, so we started with a pure state of electronic. Through this matrix, we have a combination of new one, new two, and new three. And during propagation, if the masses are different, the contribution, the weight of each contribution will change. And when we apply the detection, we have to project back on the flavor states using the inverse of this mixing matrix. And starting with a 100% electron state, we may end up with a, another contribution, a non-zero contribution from the, from the two other flavors. So to describe the co uh, this uh, mixing, we need three mixing angles to mix uh, one and two, one and three, two and three. And we need, uh, we, we need uh, differences in, in the mass when you write down the formalism, what enters in, uh, uh, in play is the, the splitting between the mass square. So there are only two independent splitting parameters. And that's where the way we, we generally write this uh, mixing matrix. So it's a, a product of three rotations. Here we mix state two and three. Here we mix one and three. Here we mix one and two. And the C and S are just the cosine and sine functions, usual uh, rotation matrix. And today, uh, we know basically all the parameters. Uh, the last uh, missing uh, uh, angle was the theta 1, 3, and it has been measured laterally uh, with reactor experiments. I will show you the results later in my talk. And uh, the mass splitting, you see, that they are very small, 10 to the minus 5 EV square, 10 to the minus 3 EV square. And they are well uh, distinct. Uh, there is a factor 30 difference between the two. So it means that uh, in the mixing process, you have really two decoupled regimes because of these two separated mass splitting. Uh, last point about oscillation. You heard uh, a few weeks ago that the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to this guy for the discovery of oscillation. This is the third neutrino, third Nobel Prize for neutrinos. And so the first observation of clear signal uh, uh, of an oscillation was again in Super Kamiokande in, uh, in Japan where they, they were looking at neutrinos produced by cosmic rays in the atmosphere. So you have done going neutrinos produced just above the detector, but also upgoing neutrinos produced in the atmosphere on the other side of the Earth, going through the Earth, and then interacting in the detector. And if you look at the um, downgoing versus upgoing neutrinos, you, you do see the difference in counting rate. This is corrected for solid angle effects and everything. The difference is just because here you have a longer baseline, a, a, a longer time of flight that gives time to the neutrino, the muon neutrino, to convert it into tau neutrino. And uh, the second experiment was about the solar problem. Uh, all experiments were looking at the electronic neutrinos from the sun, and they were all reporting 50%, 70%, 50% missing contribution with respect to the prediction. And this guy came up with a nice idea where instead of looking at the electronic neutrinos using beta processes, uh, he proposed an experiment where he was uh, looking at the uh, um, breakup of the deuterium in uh, heavy water here. A neutrino could uh, elastically interact with, uh, well, quasi-elastically interact with deuterium, just enough energy to break up into a proton and a neutron, and he was detecting the, the, the capture of the neutron afterwards. And this process can be induced by any neutrino, electron, muon, or tau. So he was measuring the sum of all the, all the flux. And so the sum was perfectly in agreement with the prediction. So it was really a proof that all the missing contribution pointed out by the other experiments were due to the oscillation into other flavors. So oscillation is now well proven also and, and well understood process. OK, so now let me uh, uh, come to the main uh, uh, subject of my talk, which is the reactor neutrinos. Uh, and we will see that uh, they also brought a very nice contribution to these oscillation measurements. Uh, so as you know, the neutrinos, uh, uh, are the, the, the reactors are very intense source of neutrinos. This is the, the basic idea when we uh, 
fission, when, when a heavy nucleus like uranium nucleus uh, is fissioning, the two fission products are unstable nuclei and they are uh, neutron rich nuclei. So they will evolve towards stability using uh, by uh, beta minus processes and each step uh, corresponds to the emission of uh, one electron and one antineutrinos of electron type. So uh, if on the average, of course, there are many, many uh, uh, possibility to uh, break this nucleus in two parts. But on average, uh, there is six beta decays from the two fission products. So six neutrinos emitted per fission. One fission is about roughly 200 MeV. So if you want to produce one gigawatt of uh, power, this is something like 10, more than 10 to the 20 neutrinos per second emitted by your, by your reactor. So very intense source, that's nice because we need a lot of neutrinos if we want to detect few of them. Uh, it's a pure source of uh, anti-neutrinos of electronic types because of this beta minus process. And the energy is well defined too. This is nuclear processes, so between zero and 10 MeV. Uh, now, if we want to work with the flux and energy spectrum of these neutrinos, we are facing a quite complex uh, spectrum. Uh, because, as I told uh, uh, previously, uh, there are something like 800 possible uh, different nuclei that are produced uh, with the fissions, and the number of uh, beta branches are several thousands. So, if we want to enter the guts of this uh, total neutrino spectrum, it's a kind of nightmare. <coughs> the sum of all the neutrinos uh, that will be emitted by the reactor, they first they come from all the possible fission products. So we need the activity of all the products, how many fissions, how many um, of these nuclei were present and what are their lifetimes so that we can compute the activity. Uh, and then this is multiplied by the spectrum, the, the total beta spectrum for this fission product. So that's the first sum over all the fission products. Now I'm looking at one single fission product. Of course, we have a decay scheme with several excited levels uh, in, the, in the daughter nucleus. So we have to make the sum of all the beta branches, so weighted by the branching ratios. And this is the expression for one single branch from the ground state of the, of the, phaser, the phaser nucleus to, the, to one specific state of the daughter nucleus. Uh, how do we um, uh, write down this, um, uh, this beta spectrum? Well, there is a first piece of um, theory that was uh, uh, provided by Fermi in the, back in the 30s, which is, let's say, still quite simple. Uh, there is a normalization factor coming from the weak interaction, and uh, then the Fermi function that uh, take into account the fact that the, the leptons are escaping from the charged nucleus. So uh, you have Coulomb effect that change a little bit the energy spectrum. And then the shape of this energy spectrum is dominated by the phase space factor here. Uh, that is this expression where E0 is the end point of the transition, the maximum energy that, that is splitted between neutrino and, and the charged lepton. Now, this is not the end of the story. This is the very basic view of our, for a simple transition. In reality, uh, depending on the quantum numbers from the uh, connecting the two nuclei, you can have what so-called uh, forbidden processes when the, you change the parity or for higher uh, change in uh, total momentum, uh, ob um, orbital momentum. Uh, so uh, in that case, you have uh, some complicated nuclear matrix element that uh, enter into the into the play, and that brings extra energy dependence. And also, this is only to first order. Then yeah, there is a whole bunch of corrections, uh, QED relative corrections, finite size Coulomb correction, the fact that the weak interaction itself occurs in the finite size nucleus, the screening of the electron cloud when the charged lepton escapes the nucleus, and the weak magnetism effect, which is a, it's a term that comes when the, the energy of the leptons is high enough, you have kind of weak magnetic effect, like you have magnetic effect for in the electro, electro, electromagnetism uh, case. So uh, that's a lot of information to deal with, and uh, we'll see that uh, it's very difficult 
to get that from all the measurements, all the nuclear databases, although we are doing really great <laughs> progress in that. <coughs> but really what we want to do with this prediction is to look for oscillations, for instance. So we are looking at small distortion in the spectrum, let's say the 10% scale. How can you be sure that computing all this stuff, you will end up with a 10% accuracy? This is really challenging, okay? So the real breakthrough was uh, brought in the, in the 80s, uh, just, pe just before people started to look for oscillation at reactors, actually. They, they were waiting this, the, this data. Um, Mr. Uh, Schreckenbar and others uh, uh, installed this uh, experimental setup at the ILL re reactor in Grenoble in France. They used this uh, long tube under vacuum that could uh, uh, go very close to the core of the, of the reactor in a very intense uh, thermal neutron flux. And uh, they exposed uh, some foils of uranium or plutonium isotopes to this very intense flux. Of course, there were many fission uh, uh, processes inducing this foil and beta processes from the instable fission products. And some of the electrons coming from these beta decays were just escaping right in the axis of this tube, and then it entered in the magnetic spectrometer, very accurate analysis of the momentum of the electron. And this way, uh, by scanning the field of this uh, magnet, they could just build up the total uh, uh, beta spectrum from associated to one fission of uranium or plutonium isotope. So that these are very precious data and very accurate because of the, this kind of uh, because of the type of experimental setup that was used. And they are really a, a unique reference. We know that the total contribution of all the, the beta electrons from the fission is that. That's only the sum. We do not have all the ingredients inside, but we know that the sum is that. That's already a big piece of information. Uh, now I cannot use that for my, for my neutrino experiment. I need neutrino spectrum, not electron spectrum. So how do I convert that? Well, that's the... You can say it's very simple. There is energy conservation. So uh, the energy of the electron plus the energy of the neutrino is always equal to the endpoint. So if you look at a, at a single branch, see this is an, an electron branch with endpoint E0. <coughs> because of Coulomb effect, the start of the spectrum is not zero here. And if you apply energy conservation, the neutrino spectrum is just the, 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 the mirror image of this uh, beta branch. Very simple. <coughs> but you cannot uh, apply that to a complex spectrum where several branches are contributing. That's uh, the example of, for this, um, this atom that I show you here. Uh, it's a sum of uh, three or four branches. And you see that, uh, so this is the red curve. If you apply the mirror symmetry with respect to 1.5, that gives you a completely different spectrum than the, the real neutrino spectrum. That's because this mirror image ha has to be applied on every single branch, not on the total sum of the branches. And that's an information that we do not have from, uh, from these measurements. So how do we do? So the idea that uh, they developed <coughs> is to use a, a conversion process, procedure. Uh, it's a very simple idea. They use kind of virtual or effective beta branch. They are not corresponding to any existing nucleus in nature, but they have the, cur the, the good shape, this Fermi theory, the phase space factor, the, the, the um, uh, Fermi function, etc. And we leave the endpoint and the amplitude of this virtual branch free, and we fit that to the, to the high energy part of the spectrum. So you see here that the first branch is really fitting very well the end of the spectrum. Once this is done, you subtract the contribution of this branch, you get a new uh, total spectrum, fit again the high energy part with one more branch, etc., etc. And at the end, it's possible to completely zero the, the initial spectrum, and so that the sum of all the virtual branches is e exactly uh, the total electron spectrum that was measured. Okay, so these are virtual branches, but they do have the good energy uh, dependence from the, from, from the Fermi theory, 
and the sum of all these branch is bang on the, on the electron data. So now you can take every single virtual branch and convert them into, into neutrino using, using this trick here, because for one single branch, you, you can do that. So use this mirror image for all the single branch and compute the sum of all the converted branch again, and that gives us the, the total neutrino spectrum. So that's how uh, we got the reference neutrino spectra for the different fissions in the reactor, the, the main isotopes, uranium-35, plutonium-39, plutonium-41. Three different curves with a, a complete error budget. We have a, a correlation matrix for this, uh, for this spectra uh, with normalization, uh, shape errors. Everything is well uh, detailed and argued. And that was the reference over the last 25 years. Uh, okay, so it looks like we are ready to perform neutrino, uh, reactor neutrino experiments. We still need a, a detection process. Um, and the golden channel is really this one, the inverse beta decay. <coughs> uh, thinking about a, ne a neutral current process is not a good idea because uh, you have only one single particle recalling, like in the Gargamel chamber. Any gammas in your detector, in, uh, in the rock outside, or any kind of background uh, will induce the same kind of signals. It will be very difficult to find out your, uh, to recover your few neutrinos per day among this huge background. So this process provides a very selective sequence in time and in energy. So the antineutrino of electronic type interact with the proton of the target. And this is the inverse beta process. At, in the final state, we have a positron and a neutron. The positron uh, what we use for the target and the detection actually is an organic scintillator because it combines nicely the fact that it has a lot of protons for the target. And as soon as the particle uh, propagates into that liquid, they will uh, give signals. So the positron gives a prompt signal. That's a first flash of light from the, this positron. If you look at the kinematics, uh, these are very heavy objects particles, so basically all the kinetic energy of the neutrino is, trans is transferred to the positrons, so that's a way to measure the energy of the incoming neutrino. And then the neutron is emitted with few ten of kV of kinetic energy. It, it will take few microseconds to lose its energy, to thermalize in the liquid, and then uh, start to diffuse, like in a reactor. And so, and what we will do uh, generally in, in the organic scintillator, we will dope this uh, scintillator with a, a, a neutron absorber like ga gadolinium, cadmium, uh, lithium, whatever. So we'll have a clear signal about the neutron capture a few 10 microseconds later. So that's a very uh, uh, um, characteristic pattern, a lot more difficult to simulate so it reduces a lot the background, and that's a way to detect neutrinos. And so we have the emitted spectrum, what I was showing you, the, the, the reference spectra from the ILL data. They were in log scale. If you look at linear scale, they, they, they have this uh, exponential shape. And the cross-section for this inverse beta decay process is a kind of parabola, uh, starting at 1.8 MeV because there is an energy threshold to induce this reaction because the neutron and positrons weight uh, more than the, than the neutrino and uh, a proton at rest. So multiply the two curves, we get this kind of uh, expected uh, shape for the detected uh, <coughs> spectrum uh, when uh, looking uh, at uh, neutrinos from a reactor. We can do that for uh, every uh, uh, fissioning isotopes, uranium and plutonium. And uh, we do see a first interesting fact is that the, uh, the number of uh, neutrinos detected after one fission of, of uh, plutonium is less than for the fissions of uh, uranium-235 or plutonium-241 just due to the fact that there are different nucleus fissioning, so different distribution of uh, mass in the fission products and different kind of neutrinos. Uh, okay, so now we have all the ingredients uh, that we need. We have the, our predicted spectrum. Uh, we still need to talk with the reactor operator to know uh, 
what is the full power, uh, the total power of the reactor, what is the history of the fuel, so that we know the relative contribution of these various isotopes, but that's something we can do with reasonable accuracy. And then we can have the prediction versus time of the expected neutrino spectrum that we should see in our detector. And uh, if we want to look at oscillations away from the reactor, so the reactor is here at distance zero. <coughs> our prediction is normalized to one, just neutrino flux. And I'm looking at the neutrino flux versus distance for a mean energy of four MeV. That's about the, the energy, the mean energy that I have from the, from the prediction. So uh, in my detector, since I use this uh, beta inverse process, uh, I'm only sensitive to uh, the, the electronic neutrinos. They certainly do not have enough energy to produce uh, charged muons or charged tau on shell. You need uh, tens, hundreds of uh, MeV to produce that. This is not possible from a reactor. So we can only detect this uh, uh, anti-neutrino of electronic type. And if they do oscillate, they will convert to some fraction in other flavors. So we will see a missing contribution in the, detect in the detected flux. So that's a disappearance. All the reactor experiments are looking for disappearance of the electronic neutrinos. And that's the formula plugging in the, this uh, rotation matrices and mixing matrices. One has uh, the amplitude of the phenomenon given by the mixing angle and the frequency uh, given by the mass splitting and the position, distance between source and detector and the mean energy of the neutrino. Uh, so here the mean energy is fixed to 4 MeV. The distance between the source and the detector is my axis here. And the mass splitting, I told you that we have two different mass splitting that differs by a factor 30. So I expect two different regime of oscillation at a factor 30 difference in the distance. Okay, that's what I observe here. The first mass splitting, you expect the first oscillation around between one and two kilometers. And the second mass splitting is 30 times uh, larger, so the first minimum will occur 30 times further away from the reactor, and this is the second <coughs> parameter here. So that's basically the, the expectation uh, from, the <coughs> uh, from the oscillation processes for the, re the, the reactor neutrinos. Okay, so uh, for the reactors, I would say no. If you go through huge amount of matter, as it is the case for the uh, solar neutrinos, they are emitted in the core of the sun where the, uh, the fusion occurs, and they have to exit the sun. So they, they go through a huge thickness of matter. And there, you have a, a kind of effective potential of, uh, inside the matter because you have more electrons than muons or tau in the matter. So there are m more channels open uh, to electronic neutrinos than, uh, than millions or thousands of neutrinos. So you have this kind of matter effect that can also uh, change the projection in the flavor states. Yeah. But you have to go to uh, hundreds, uh, uh, several hundred kilometers uh, through the Earth or through matter. Otherwise, it's just a, a dependence on the L over E uh, ratio. Okay. So you have this sinus, uh, this is a log scale, okay? So this, this curve is, is, is just a sine curve, same oscillation going up and down forever. And then it couples with the second one that will go up and down uh, again forever. <coughs> As a function of time, uh, there is no. You mean you, you you would like to follow in time the evolution of the neutrino? Okay, so so, so this you can we cannot do because uh, the, the the neutrino detectors the the largest neutrino detectors we have is the super Camio Condé. It's uh, 40 meters diameter, 40 meters high. That's a huge volume, but still uh, the probability for, for a reactor neutrino to interact 
with the, within this huge volume is maybe 1 over 10 to the 15. So you need to send 10 to the 15 neutrinos through this volume to have one interaction. Okay? So there is no way you can uh, have uh, several interactions uh, of the same neutrino. I don't, I don't know if it answers your, your questions. But we, we, we do not follow in time the neutrino. The, there is only very few neutrinos that interact sometime in our detector. With this process, it is absorbed anyway. There is no, it is not a elastic scattering. It is absorbed on the proton. So the only uh, information we have access to is the dependence on distance and energy. So uh, from the theory, we know that there are some particular distances where the oscillation will be at the maximum. That's where we want to put the experiment. And once the, the detector is fixed at one distance, you can look further at the energy dependence. Because this plot is for one energy fixed at 4 MeV. If I decide to look at this oscillation, I will set up a detector two kilometers away from the reactor, but then I, I still have some uh, energy dependence from two to eight MeV. So because of this function, I will also see oscillation pattern in my detector at a fixed distance. So that's the two lever arms we have to study the, the oscillation. Can I, can I ask the same question? Okay. Okay, so the, the source is, is changing, but uh, what will uh, happen is that uh, when you start a, a reactor with fresh fuel, that's, you will be just on the red curve, and during the cycle, you will uh, kind of mix the red and the, and the green one. So the, the neutrino flux will decrease with time. I will talk to that. Uh, so we, we just have to follow the history of the reactor, and we have a, a, a prediction of the neutrino flux versus time. This is true. But just because the fact, uh, just because the reactor accumulates plutonium, we have to take that into account, and we know that the, the flux will decrease in time. But uh, so we have a, a prediction versus time, and we have data versus time, and we compare the two, and the difference is only the, the oscillation. Okay. But it's true that uh, there is an evolution in time of the neutrino spectrum. That, that, that's correct, because of the operation of the reactor, which will not be the same for the sun. For instance, for the sun is kind of constant to our time scale. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, that's the oscillation we expect at reactors. Uh, I have to hurry up because I would, I would be too long otherwise. Um, so the, a very nice experiment in Japan, they still with this, uh, in this Kamiokan they mined, they, they had a 1,000 ton of liquid scintillator in a big sphere here, and they were looking at all the reactors around from Japan and Korea, tens of reactors. And they were following the history of all the reactors, talking to the operators, uh, having all the power history, the refueling tank, uh, the loading maps, etc. And they computed the expected spe spectrum uh, they run the experiment for a few years, <coughs> and that's what they, they obtained. They uh, put all their events in bins of L over E, because this is the ratio that is uh, important for the oscillation pattern. So the expectation with no oscillation is the, would be a horizontal line, one, and that, that's what they observed. Uh, to my knowledge, that's the only experiment that do see a first maximum minimum, second maximum, second minimum. That's a really nice pattern. It's very difficult to obtain such a curve. You, you do see that the amplitude is not a perfect sine curve. It is kind of damping, and this is due to the resolution effect. That's why it's so difficult to have several patterns like that. Usually you try to work in this area, and it's very difficult to get several, uh, several patterns. How do they, so how do they, know which uh, they, they do not know. So they have uh, just uh, a waiting contribution, weighted contribution from all the, all the reactors, depending on their power and distance. And the neutrino that you, this neutrino that you detect at this time, you absolutely, 
the authority do not know where it was coming from, but uh, when you build up all the events versus time, you know that the mean answer should be your prediction. You, you cannot affect one neutrino uh, to one detector. So it's true that uh, you have some uncertainty in the mean baseline, for instance. For instance, there are reactors that are uh, 100 kilometers away, uh, others that are 60 kilometers away. So it's a kind of smearing. That's why also you see that, in theory, these oscillations should go back to one. Minimum, back to one, etc. They do not go back to one because of all this smearing process. Oh, um, in, the, in that case, maybe it's comparable in flux. Uh, w one kilometer away from a, from a reactor, I think you have something like, uh, yeah, the, the reactor is really dominating in flux by far. Uh, here, it's uh, kind of long distance, so maybe it becomes comparable. But anyway, we are not sensitive to the s solar neutrinos because they are neutrinos. The reactor emits anti neutrinos so you here th these are neutrinos from the fission the sun is fusion okay and with the beta inverse process only the anti neutrino can contribute so whatever the solar flux is we just don't care <laughs> i mean they they can induce some electron recoils from time to time but they, they will not co correspond to this uh, prompt and delayed uh, time sequence that we expect from the positron and the neutron capture. Okay. Okay. Okay, maybe uh, I can answer later in the talk, but uh, yeah, the, uh, when you are deep in the ground like that, uh, one big piece of background that is uh, really suppressed is the, the one induced by the cosmic rays. <coughs> and then uh, they took also uh, very great care about the radio purity of all the materials to lower the, the radioactivity. Um, how can you deal with that? Uh, I don't know if you guys go into many details, but uh, background from two gammas, for instance. You have one gamma, and then right in the good uh, time, another gamma that is consistent with the energy of a neutron capture. That could be a fake event. But if you look at the distribution in, in time of this kind of event, these are accidentals. They are basically flat in time. It's, a, it's an exponential with very, very uh, long uh, decay time, oh, one over the frequency of your background. So you can measure that online. When you look for a neutrino, instead of looking for the neutron capture just after the prompt, you look for it 10 seconds after or 10 seconds before, or one second or 12 seconds or whatever. You can do that a thousand times, and you just measure your accidental background online very accurately. And then this is subtracted stat statistically from your data. So if the, if the rate is too high at the beginning, you're kind of bad situation. I will show you the other data later in the talk. Uh, but you can subtract it, of course, still. But you will be uh, uh, spoiled by the statistical fluctuation of your large background. And for the muons, uh, there are all kinds of processes induced by muons. And there are techniques to select that to from, the, from the neutrinos. Uh, but it's, it's true that there are very few experiments that have uh, <coughs> Only those experiments that are looking to one or two reactors, actually, they can have some time both reactors or, or the single reactor off, and then you measure the, the actual background, which is very nice. But that, that's a very rare piece of information. Uh, yeah, so that's the second uh, oscillation pattern that was uh, measured uh, lately <coughs> at the reactors. This is actually a French concept that was developed initially by the double show. Uh, uh, the double show collaboration. So the, the show site is in France, uh, close to the Belgium border. And we have these two powerful reactors. And uh, the idea is to uh, put two identical detectors underground, one, uh, one kilometer away and another one close to the reactors, and just compare 
the, the measurement in both detectors. This one is measuring the neutrino spectrum before it starts oscillating. And this one is just at the maximum of the oscillation. And in this case, you don't care about what the reactor operators are doing, what is the power, what is the composition of the fuel. They are measuring the same flux at the same time, and you just take the ratio uh, to look at your uh, oscillations. And that, that's the kind of, uh, so that there are other experiments in uh, China, Diabe experiment, and in Korea with the Reno experiment. I show you here the most uh, precise results so far. You see the kind of, uh, that was the last mixing angle we were missing, the Theta 1, 3. We were missing it because it's kind of small. The other one, they are close to maximum, 45 degrees. That's the maximum mixing you can induce. This one is uh, close to 8 degrees. Uh, and so now that's the kind of accuracy we can put on this, these measurements. And you see the data here. This is one example of, uh, so that's the configuration. They have six different reactors here close to the, close to the sea. And uh, they, have, they have several sets of detectors monitoring these reactors and one set of detectors far away to compare with the, the near detector. That's the measurement in the far detector set up here compared, compared with the prediction with no oscillation. And even they do not know, the, they, they, they do not need the prediction. They just take the ratio between these data and the data in the near detector. And that's what they get, this nice oscillation curve. And if you, so this is uh, versus energy. If you combine your data in L over E using different uh, combination of detectors and energy, there you have this nice sine curve with the distribution of all the data. Okay, so that's the situation we have now with reactors. Uh, the Kamlan point is somewhere here. They really have seen this big uh, deficit of neutrinos due to the uh, one set of uh, mixing parameter. <laughs> and the other three experiments have seen also this uh, other uh, regime of oscillation. And uh, if we look further uh, at this curve, that's nice here. We do not have any oscillations. And I will show you later there are many experiments that were performed between 10 and 100 meters away from the reactor. And they, are, they were all flat, no sign of oscillations. Uh, so uh, that's the idea since now, now we are really entering uh, this era of precision measurement. It's not a matter of saying where well, neutrinos exist or not. We are doing really precise measurement, percent level pre uh, measurements with the neutrinos. Uh, so we have a kind of mature technology to deal with these uh, uh, kind of phantomatic particles. And so that brings the idea to uh, apply for the first time neutrinos uh, to some uh, uh, societal uh, um, topic, like the surveillance of uh, nuclear reactors. Oh, because they, it's an average uh, point. Yeah. They, they, as I said, when the neutrino interact in the detector, you do not know from what reactor it is coming. Okay. Okay. So uh, they accumulate enough statistics and, uh, and they, they compare with the prediction where everything is average from all the, all the reactors. But you are still putting on some it, it, it's like the, the, for all the reactors, you have the history in time. You have the power history and the fuel composition. So you have the prediction uh, versus time. And you are sampling one or two neutrinos per day from each reactor. So, okay. so if, if you wait for 10 days, you are totally lost. You, you do not know what you are doing. But if you have thousands of neutrinos, then you can see the mean effect of the oscillation with respect to your mean prediction of the sum of all the reactors. So yeah, uh, I could have put uh, some error bar here if you want, uh, from the, but that's the mean effect. Uh, it, it, it's just for uh, yeah, a kind of pedagogical plot because uh, these curves do not correspond to the prediction of this experiment because of all these mirroring effects. That's right. OK, so just my only message here is to point out that we could have this application at short distance from a reactor. Why short distance? Because uh, the idea is to discuss with the IAEA people and uh, possibly provide a new tool for the surveillance of reactor. So we don't want to bring Kamlang 
close to any reactor, a uh, thousand uh, uh, ton of liquid scintillator. So uh, it has to be something small, like a one cubic meter scale, few meters uh, uh, footprint, uh, easy to install. And uh, so uh, if we go close enough to the reactor, uh, it's, it's like a neutrino camera, <coughs> we could have enough signal to follow the operation of the reactor. So that's the, uh, what I, we can uh, say about the evolution of, the, of a nuclear uh, reactor. As you know, uh, this, is, uh, one, uh, this is the beginning of one cycle in the, in the life of the reactor. We just replace one third of the fuel by fresh fuel. So when the reactor restarts, it is dominated by fission from uranium. We still have some plutonium in the core that is also participating in contributing to the fissions. And uh, as the reactor operates, uh, uranium is burnt, while plutonium is produced by the neutron captures and contribute more and more to the, to the fissions up to 50-50 at the end of the cycle. So uh, as we said uh, uh, in the previous slide, when we are close to the start of a cycle, we are, the expected uh, spectrum is close to this blue curve of the, uh, the, this uh, red curve of uranium-235. And when the reactor operates and we go further in the cycle, we will decrease and move toward this uh, green curve while we never reach it. We, we are never pure plutonium in the pure plutonium regime, but uh, this curve is ev ev evolving from the red to the green curve. If we put numbers on that, it occurs that, okay, uh, one fission of uranium emits less energy than one fission of plutonium. That's not negligible, it's a 5% difference. So if you want to operate your reactor at the same power, you need 5% less fission of plutonium. So you will have at least 5% less neutrinos just because of that. Then looking at all the fission products, the number of neutrinos per fission is also lower for plutonium. And the mean energy per fission for the, the, the mean neutrino energy per fission is also lower, so the interaction cross-section is lower. So all the factors accumulate together. So if we compare uh, pure, uh, uh, let's say, one, one gigawatt produced by pure uh, uranium-35 fissions compared to one gigawatt from pure uh, plutonium-39 fissions, the ratio is 1.6 in the neutrino flux that you expect. And so uh, if we follow the history of the reactor, that's the, the kind of curve that uh, we expect. This is a simple simulation for a one cubic meter uh, detector with 50% detection efficiency. It is, setting, it is set uh, 25 meters away from a, a standard PWR reactor, let's say. <coughs> we assume that the power is constant. And because of this evolution of the core, the neutrino rate we detect is decreasing in time. And when the reactor stops for, to change the part of the fuel, uh, one third of the spent fuel is replaced by fresh fuel, pure uranium. So this is uh, one or 200 kilograms of plutonium that is removed from the, from the core. The reactor restarts at the same power, but we do see the jump in the neutrino rate because we change the composition of the core. And that's the idea of the non-proliferation. Of course, you see when, uh, when we remove 200 kilograms of plutonium, we do see it. The question is, uh, how far can we go till uh, it's really uh, a relevant uh, mean of surveillance useful for IAEA? And of, of course, the, the principle is the <coughs> so is really the, this control of the, the plutonium uh, content. Uh, as you know, I guess there are two ways to uh, produce uh, uh, weapon grade. Uh, material, either at the level of the enrichment, if we, if we uh, uh, continue this process to very high level uh, of uh, enrichment, quasi-pure uranium, that's one way to build the bomb. And the other possible material is plutonium-239, which is not existing in nature, but that is produced in the reactor. And that's the idea of this surveillance by the neutrinos. Since we do produce plutonium, and this is uh, chemically different from the rest of the, the fuel, it can be separated. It's not an easy process, but uh, that's one possibility. 
So uh, the idea of the, of the monitoring by the neutrinos is to uh, survey uh, this stage and uh, to know uh, what amount of plutonium is in the reactor and if we do see any subit change or some possible diversion um, of the uh, plutonium associated to a change in the neutrino rate. Uh, so we have stringent specification for, uh, before uh, 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 being of interest for the uh, international agency. <coughs> uh, first, they want something compact, portable, possibly operating close to surface. All, all that we don't want for a neutrino detector. Usually, you want to have huge targets <laughs> and deep underground, right? So that's the first challenge. Uh, it has to be safe, of course. Uh, which is uh, okay, I think, for, for this kind of application. We are outside the confinement uh, uh, vessel, outside the, the core uh, building, and there is no uh, big uh, impact we can expect on the safety of the, of the reactor. It has to be simple because the idea is to uh, uh, avoid uh, on-site inspection. This is the very costly uh, monitoring of reactor for the agency. Uh, so neutrino, that's one asset of the neutrinos. You have direct connection with the fission process inside the core, and you can uh, still uh, have a remotely controlled detector sending cryptic data to the agency in, uh, in Vienna. Okay, so the big challenge still <coughs> is that we have to simplify uh, the, our uh, state-of-the-art uh, neutrino detectors, make it smaller, uh, cheaper, and we have to operate this less performing uh, detector in a very large uh, background uh, environment. <coughs> so that's two opposite uh, challenges <coughs> we have to deal with. So we have to say a few words <coughs> about the background <coughs> we have to fight for, <coughs> uh, against, I would say. <coughs> um, since we are using this process of detection with the positron and neutron in the final state, uh, we discussed a little of that following the uh, Dana's questions. So one, f one first class of background is the accidental background. One gamma from whatever radioactivity, uh, if we are close to the core, it could be a leakage from the core itself. And uh, one neutron or another gamma that with, with energy compatible with the signal of the neutron capture. So <coughs> uh, what can we do uh, against that? Well, we have to shield the detector with uh, polyethylene and lead to absorb all this uh, radiation from the uh, environment. And uh, the remaining contribution, as I said, uh, we can measure it using this off-time window technique and subtract it. But we have to develop enough shielding around uh, our target to first reduce this contribution to acceptable levels. <coughs> and the other kind of background is uh, what we call the correlated background. This time, this is a single particle that will induce the whole process. <coughs> Here, this is a one million from the, from the cosmic ray shower. Uh, <coughs> if, it, if this muon interacts close to the detector, in the sailing or in the shielding around the detector, <coughs> we don't see the muon itself, but it can produce by spallation uh, reaction, it, ca it can produce a fast neutron, fast enough to bounce several protons in our target, and we, we, we do see the recalling protons, and we interpret that as a prompt signal. This is mimicking the, the positron. And then the neutron will uh, thermalize, diffuse, and get captured. This is the second part of our signal. There's nothing we can do against that, except the only difference is that we have recalling protons, not positrons, so we could use some pulse shape discrimination capacities uh, of the liquid. <coughs> what can we do uh, so against this background? Uh, well, if we stay on the parking lot, uh, there is, uh, up to now, nobody could achieve uh, neutrino detection. The natural cosmic background is just too high. We still need to be, uh, like here in this room, with uh, one or two ceilings above, the, above our head. That's enough to calm down the lowest uh, uh, energetic uh, showers. <coughs> uh, we use, uh, uh, around our, our detector, we have muon vetoes to try to tag all the muons that are passing nearby, but it, it doesn't uh, uh, 
cut everything, but at least part of it. And as I said, the, the last piece of uh, <coughs> information we can use is the pulse shape discrimination between a recurring proton and positron. The shape of the signal can be different. Uh, at the end, uh, the remaining contribution, we can still uh, subtract it if we have reactor off data, which will occur in this case because we are, we are, it's a one detector very close to one core. So each time they, they refuel it, we have reactor off data. Uh, I will show you f uh, interesting data we have from previous experiments. The first one, uh, the pioneer experiment, is from the Russian guy. <coughs> uh, actually, they, they were using uh, <coughs> the Rovno, uh, the Rovno uh, 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 reactor. It was a very nice site. They were only 18 meters away from the core and just underneath, underneath the, the reactor. So huge protection against the muons, the cosmic rays. And still, they, they had a good piece of shielding between the core and, and their detector, so the, the background was not that high. And it was a quite simple detector. You see just the, the mechanical structure here with all the PMTs that will be plugged uh, in these uh, holes. Uh, and inside, there is a one cubic meter of uh, liquid scintillator doped with gadolinium. <coughs> And that's the kind of data they took in, the, in 88. You do see the, that the neutrino rate follows the, the operation of the reactor. You, you see the on-off uh, periods. And more impressive, so they, they were able to accumulate 174,000 events at that time. Uh, that's the, the kind of uh, spectrum uh, that they get. And uh, more interesting, if you look at the rate versus time, they observe this kind of the, this decrease of the neutrino rate because of the accumulation of plutonium versus time in, in the cycle. This is a one-year cycle here. And they could, uh, because they have uh, this so large statistic, they could even look at the, the shape variation of the spectrum when we go from uh, uranium-rich to plutonium-rich. There is a slight tilt of the spectrum, which is quite really difficult to, to see, but they were able to see it with a nice... Uh, significant, taking the ratio between the, the end and the start of the cycle. <coughs> so that validates basically uh, the, the idea that we do have uh, information from the neutrinos. Uh, there was a, an American experiment uh, done in the early 2000. Uh, they were close to the San Onofre uh, reactor. Looking at the, well, it, it depends on your detector. That, that's also a compromise. So this, is measured, this is measured, yeah, yeah. This is measured. This is measured. The, that, that's, the, that's the energy spectrum, yeah, sorry. This is energy. Yeah, so this, is <coughs> this is energy. Yeah. Now, so th that's a compromise. Here you, you see you have many PMTs all around. Uh, Okay, so it was back in the 80s and in, on that detector, I don't know what was the, the safety issues. Uh, it's not, maybe not very easy, easy to put electronics close to the liquid uh, with leakage possibility at the bottom of the vessel, things like that. So now we are trying to develop concepts with uh, everything on the top, uh, something simpler, uh, safer, things like that. But each time you lose re energy resolution, light collection, things like that. So it's always a, a, a trade-off, a compromise between uh, safety, simplicity, and this kind of uh, very nice uh, resolution. So that, that's the kind of extreme example uh, in the US. They would really wanted to go with a very simple, light detector, something that you could uh, easily uh, bring in, uh, in a truck, uh, put uh, close to the reactor, and just leave it, uh, leave it alone for one or two years. <coughs> And that's what they did at the Sun on the They were using this uh, so-called uh, tendon gallery. Uh, they have large cables that are going through the, this dome with big screws that they tight from time, time to time just to keep the, the whole thing uh, well uh, stable. And that was, this gallery is all around uh, 
the building and uh, it was large enough to uh, uh, install this detector. Uh, so see the, you see the scale, this is one meter by one meter. This is the, the target. It is just four cells next to each other with two PMTs on the top filled with liquid scintillator points. Uh, the shielding, these are shelves uh, bought at uh, Kmart or where, whatever, and with, uh, what, with uh, aquariums filled with water. No lead, no, no shielding other than that. And big plates of uh, plastic scintillator around to see the muons going nearby. So it was very low cost, very simple design, <coughs> and, uh, and, and the site is nice too because they are well protected by the, the building against the muons. Not very deep, but still uh, fine. And they are far away from the reactor, so no, no gammas from the reactor, nothing. Uh, and that's the kind of data they could, uh, they could obtain. Again, you see the history of the, you see the decrease <coughs> of the neutrino rate versus time. Uh, so they did some statistical studies. Within four hours, they can say at 99% level that the reactor has stops. I don't know. Maybe not very useful, but uh, that's another. In case of undeclared stop to divert material, that's maybe a useful piece of information if you do not have other uh, surveillance. Uh, so reactor stop, this is the level of background with respect to signal. That's quite nice. And then when they start again, you see the, the jump because they removed 250 kilograms of plutonium in, the, in that case for the reactor. Now the drawback, uh, if you look more in, in details, one point is 30 days, okay? This uh, size of, uh, of error is 30 days, one month. And this is 200 kilograms of plutonium. Uh, so this is the limitation of this measurement. It's so simple uh, detector that they, lose, they lost a lot uh, in the detection efficiency. Only 10% of the neutrino interacting in their detector were useful or able to be treated by the analysis. <coughs> and the last experiment I want to talk about is a uh, new CIFR. So I was involved in this project at CES, at CES Aclay. There we, <coughs> we had the possibility to install a small neutrino detector. Again, that's, one, uh, that's close to one uh, cubic meter uh, vessel. We have an uh, acrylic buffer here to decouple the liquid, the liquid from, the, from the PMTs and just two rings of PMTs on the top. This is a double-walled uh, vessel, uh, and then it's very safe and a uh, uh, very stable uh, detector. And we are able to install that just against the, the pool, the, the wall of the reactor pool, seven meters away from a 70 megawatt uh, reactor. So uh, <coughs> I think that's uh, the closest measurement ever, ever tried <laughs> from a reactor. Um, what we were trying to do, so of course there the background of the reactor is huge. When you enter the room, you do see on the dosimeter the, the effect of the gamma MDNs. It's not, uh, you can stay in the room, but just your personal dosimeter see it. So I can imagine <laughs> if you put a germanium detector, you, you see a lot of things. So it's a very uh, big challenge in terms of background, but we learned a lot with this, uh, this experiment. And also, when developing that, we were trying to use kind of commercial or nothing really fancy, uh, so that we, it's a kind of pre-industrial stage for further deployment with uh, several uh, copies of this kind of detector. <coughs> so as I said, we had a, a very large background, so that's the kind of shielding uh, we put around the detector. These are the plastic scintillators to veto the muons passing nearby. Uh, then all walls were covered with uh, uh, polyethylene, and the, at the, exter uh, the outer uh, layer is uh, covered with uh, lead bricks. And we had several surprises. Uh, as neutrino physicist, I didn't know that the water of the primary, the primary loop in a reactor could be activated. It's sorry, but uh, it, it looked obvious to all the people in the reactor when we discovered that, but <laughs> we just didn't know. So there is this nice process when the water goes through the core, you have NP reaction on oxygen 16 uh, that produces nitrogen 16, 
which is a beta emitter with uh, seven mV gammas and a uh, few second lifetime. So, and in that reactor in Osiris, they wanted to be able to work on the, the pump and uh, the, the cooling system while they were operating the core. So what they did is to build a kind of chicane where the water of the primary circuit do several turns back, uh, like uh, it takes a minute to exit this, uh, this big vessel. Time for all the activity of nitrogen 16 to decay. So everything was decaying next to us, in the room uh, next to us. We didn't know about that. So when we turned on the, the experiment the first time, and we look at the very center of all the events, it was pointing there, and the reactor was there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was kind of surprising. So we had to add several pieces of shielding. We, we, do, we, we did what we can, but at the end, uh, <coughs> at the end uh, that's what we got for uh, our last data. This is the kind of uh, background uh, spectrum when the reactor is off. These are number of photoelectrons. One, one MeV is about 350. This is two MeV, etc. And when the reactor turns off, uh, that's what we observe uh, just in single rate. Okay? We have something like 300 neutrinos per day, and these are counts per second. Okay? So it's a large background. This is, a 10, uh, this is 0.1. This is one hertz on top. Uh, and uh, the, the, the bad news is really in this window, this high energy window, that's where we expect the neutron capture on gadolinium. This is an 8 MeV signal with uh, energy escapes, resolution effects, so, but still we expect the high energy windows where we want our neutron capture signal to be clean. We know that at low energy where the prompt, the prompt signal is, there will be plenty of background, but when we ask for the neutron uh, partner, we wanted a very clean energy window above all the radioactivity. And that's not the case here. We do have background in the high energy windows for the neutrons and in the low energy window for the prompt, for the positrons. So this, in, in this situation, your background scales with the square of the reactor power, not, not the, the simple reactor power, because you have it in both windows. And that's basically what we observe. So 300 uh, neutrinos per, per day, but 4,700 uh, 4, candidates per day. So 300 are neutrinos, all the rest is background. Yeah, so that's the kind of uh, background we have to deal with. And you see here what I was talking about. This is the, the time between the prompt and the, and the delay signal in, uh, in microsecond. <coughs> so accidentals, they are rather flat, as we expect. That's, uh, and, and you see that uh, we can measure them pretty well. This is a, there is a good correspondence between this off-time windows event and uh, our candidates. So we can subtract this blue offset. And then in the rest of the events above, you have the correlated uh, events with the nice exponential dependence, which is the time for the capture of the neutron. And in that, we have all the correlated background from the muons and the neutrinos. And if we, if we look at the muons, <coughs> um, well, the idea was to, whatever the, the background we have, we measure it during the off period and we subtract. That's not that easy because if we look at the muon rate in our detector, it clearly correlates with the atmospheric pressure, which makes sense. It's a particle that interacts in the uh, first layer of uh, atmospheres, and then depending on the atmospheric pressure, you have more or less attenuation before reaching the, the Earth. So uh, we have to make sure that the, the mean pressure or mean muon rate is the same during the on period and the off period. So we had to look at this correlation dependence. It was more or less okay, and we had to correct for this effect. But at the end, that's, that's the signal we have. This is just the, the neutrino, what we call our neutrino candidates. <coughs> You see here that um, trying to fit uh, an offset here is just compatible with zero with a very nice accuracy. There is no sign of remaining accidental background. Uh, the time, the, the decay time of this exponential is, is just the neutron capture that we expect in our liquid. So after the subtraction of all the backgrounds, that's uh, our neutrino rate per, per day. Uh, 
kind of same plot than Rovno, you, you do see the larger uh, error bars because of this large background that is spoiling uh, the, statistic, the statistical accuracy, but still we do see the on and off periods. And now, um, uh, what can we say about the evolution of the, of, of the fuel in Osiris? Well, that's a simulation <coughs> of the uh, Osiris cycles. Um, we assume that we start with a fresh core with pure uranium. In Osiris, the, uh, the uranium fuel is enriched at 20%. 20 so it's really dominated by the fission of uranium. And moreover, the cycles are only 20, 20 days long and they, they refuel very often. So uh, that's why we need a seven or eight cycle to reach the, the equilibrium. But then after that, it, the variations are really, really very, very small. And the impact on the neutrino flux is below 1% between the beginning and the end of the cycle. So there is no way we can look within uh, our iron bar, we can look at a, such a small evolution. We, our data are compatible with flat, and there is no way we can look at these uh, sub-percent slopes here. What we try to do is um, try to discuss this uh, <coughs> sensitivity to the plutonium content, content in the framework of the, what they call the, uh, what is the name of this program again? Uh, the, PDA, the PDMA, the plutonium dis, uh, disposal, uh, uh, the US and Russia have big uh, piles of uh, uh, military grade plutoniums uh, that they have dismantled from the nuclear weapons and we have to destroy that. And uh, there is an agreement now between these two countries to uh, uh, burn that in uh, fast reactors so that after the irradiation in, in reactors, part of the plutonium is uh, just burnt and uh, transformed in fission products. And the remaining plutonium will be mixed with all these uh, other isotopes, uh, which is uh, not usable anymore for, uh, for military purposes. Uh, so we kind of studied the, this scenario here. We assume that Osiris was now burning MOX, uh, uh, MOX uh, fuel. And uh, we took our accuracy within these large background conditions. Okay, what we have now, we have measured the rate for Osiris running with uranium only. And by simulation, we, so, so we take our error bar, and by simulation, we put more and more plutonium in the core, look at the variation in rate. And we see that uh, we reach the, the two sigma, the 95% the, the uh, level uh, deviation after 1.5 kilograms of plutonium roughly, which is, so that's a small quantity of, of plutonium because it's a small reactor, of course. That's the advantage of looking at the research reactor. <coughs> if we look at the fraction of total fissile mass, it's about 10%. <coughs> so that's the kind of, um, with, with this kind of experiment, with this kind of background that is really dependent on the site, okay, for the US uh, experiment, it was a lot, lot smaller background. But here at Osiris, that's the kind of uh, accuracy that we could reach. Okay, I think I have to stop soon, so I will uh, just skip uh, a lot of uh, uh, stuff at the end of the talk. Um, so where do we are in terms of reactor surveillance? Uh, okay, there, there have been several experiments that do demonstrate that there is some capability to monitor the, the plutonium content with the neutrinos. Uh, still, it's clear that we need to demonstrate further sensitivity and, uh, and uh, deployment capability before it is uh, of any use for, for the agency. Um, for power reactor, they already have a bunch of uh, monitoring tools. They have seals. They have uh, cameras, on-site inspections. It looks difficult to divert material from these standard commercial reactors. They may be, um, and for the research reactor, they, they have also uh, items to, to look at the, the temperature of the primary uh, loop and uh, follow the, the history of, of the power. And we have to compete with kind of low cost uh, instruments. Uh, there was a kind of niche for the, what they call the bulk uh, or online refueling or online reprocessing reactors. There are several ideas uh, like the pebble bed reactors or the thorium uh, molten cell reactors. 
there it's more difficult to control what's, com what's going in and out because it's a continuous reflowing. And so the, uh, having a global picture of the operation with the neutrinos could be uh, a nice uh, device. But because of this online refueling, refueling, um, what you see is that the neutrino signal is pretty uh, stable, actually. And even if in the scenario of a diversion of plutonium, that you, uh, step by step you start diverting some uh, plutonium uh, the way you refuel your reactor, it's very difficult to have a, a big imprint in the, in the neutrino signal. So that's one limitation also for this uh, kind of reactor. And now, the, so uh, that was suggested actually by, uh, by the IAA people uh, that we uh, uh, met. It's this idea to uh, monitor the, 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 the disposal of uh, weapon grade uh, plutonium. And there it could be rather simple. It just makes sure with the neutrino that, okay, we detected that amount of neutrinos, the integral, so there was irradiation for sure. And if we compare that with the power, it means that actually plutonium was burnt, not only uranium. So it's just looking at integral numbers. It's a lot simpler, and okay, that could be a, a nice piece of information. And to go further, actually, uh, we are working on new detection techniques, uh, and uh, we have a nice synergy with fundamental research activity I wanted to uh, present uh, at the end of the talk, but I think I will skip that because I, I do not have uh, enough time now. Uh, just one word about nuclear data, because I think you have uh, you had many talks uh, in this uh, school about uh, nuclear data. <coughs> um, for all these experiments, oscillations, and also looking at the reactors, we need predictions, uh, and pretty accurate uh, predictions. And <coughs> uh, let's see, I'm missing, uh, I'm missing a slide, I think, okay. Uh, and wh wh one problem we had, uh, when looking back at this prediction and trying to uh, go uh, to more accurate uh, data, is uh, w let's consider first the conversion procedure. So I'll, I'll remind you, this is the we take the total electron data and we fit the high energy part with a virtual branch and again and again. This iterative process, we have a, a sum of 30 virtual branches and then we can convert to neutrinos. And that's the expression of one virtual branch. Okay? So there is an endpoint and a normalization factor, and this is fitted on the data, the endpoint and the normalization factor. Fine. Now, Fermi function, these are all the Coulomb effect because you are escaping from a charged nucleus. What is the charge of a virtual branch from a, from a nucleus that doesn't exist? So we have to come up with some uh, approximation looking at the nuclear databases. And uh, we do see some correspondence, some correlation between the endpoint and the Z of the, of the decaying nucleus. So we try to fit these dependencies and have a kind of model so that when the fit is going to higher endpoint, it will move also the Z. <coughs> and then there are more complications like uh, this shape factor, forbidden transitions. What is the, the forbiddenness of a virtual transition? By default, we set that to, to one and suppose it was an allowed transition. And same thing here for all these corrections. There are several approximations, <coughs> several effective, way, effective ways to implement the, the weak magnetism and the Coulomb effect. And so what we tried is to revisit these green and red points, not this one for the moment, but these two. And we just uh, pointed out that uh, back in the, in the 80s, when they provided this reference spectra, they did a kind of crude job here that could be improved, keeping the same idea, the same formalism, but just refining these approximations. And that was enough, actually, <coughs> uh, to move the prediction. So that, that was the old prediction. This is the deviation with respect to the reference spectra. And we discovered that uh, just at improving these approximations, because at that time they just thought that it was a uh, good enough, and I think that was the case. Now we want more and more precision. We just revisited these two approximations, and the consequence is to predict a slightly different shape, the slope, uh, but the main effect is a 3-4% increase of the prediction. So we, we published that in 2011, and that was a few months later uh, uh, checked by another theoretician, 
uh, in Virginia Tech and confirmed, basically. And so we were left with this uh, funny situation that the, the, the original motivation was to provide accurate correction, accurate uh, prediction for the double show experiment. That's it. And we discovered that it was impossible to improve the, the error bar, but just at least correct this bias. So the prediction moves up by 4% with the same error bar. That's the first thing. And then uh, we say, but wait, wait, wait. Now we have a new prediction. And so we can compare that with all the previous experiments that were using the old prediction. What's the situation now? So reading back all the papers, of course, they were using this uh, interaction cross-section from inverse beta decay. And the way it is calculated, <coughs> because we need it to, to compute this prediction, we need the, both the, the, the emitted spectrum and the cross-section. And the cross-section is kind of normalized by the uh, lifetime of the, of the neutron. That's a way to absorb all theoretical complications, renormalization stuff, etc. And uh, this parameter has evolved in time, constantly decreasing, actually. If you look at the publications, that's a kind of exponential uh, dependence on, on the, of the neutron lifetime versus time. <laughs> I don't know if it's a psychological effect of uh, several experiments or what. But, uh, so uh, just taking the, the current and more uh, accurate value, it's an, another shift of plus 1.5%. So at the end, the predicted spectrum is 5.5% higher. And if you use the conversion method, there is no discussion. This parameter has to be updated to the current value. And uh, this conversion uh, procedure is better when you have better approximation. So uh, that was, that's the situation we have now. Again, this is the neutrino flux versus distance from the core. This is the Camelon, the Camelon point. These are the few points for the theta 1, 3 measurements. And these are all the points that were done between 10 and 100 meters away from the, uh, from the core. 20 measurements. Within the hour bars, they were all in agreement with the previous prediction, but now the, pre the, the prediction moves up by 5.5%. So we are missing <coughs> Uh, 6.5 because the, the average of all these measurements is one was 1% 1 lower than the prediction before, but that was within the error bar. So that was minus 1% uh, plus the 5.5. It's a minus 6.5 deficit with respect to prediction. So um, maybe something is wrong with the prediction. That's one piece of work we are uh, dealing with now, but uh, uh, so far we, there is no... Uh, firm proof that uh, this is wrong. Or uh, there is another way to explain a deficit of neutrinos. Look here, deficit of neutrinos, deficit of neutrinos, and what happened? Oscillation. They were oscillating to other flavor. So maybe there is a new oscillation. The problem is that when you look at the mixing matrix, all the, all, all the possible mixing are there already. There is no possible new mixing within the neutrinos that we know. So if we want a new oscillation at very short distance, we have to invoke a new neutrino. And since we know from CERN, yeah, since we know from CERN and from uh, cosmology that there is uh, only three active neutrinos, if it is new, then it has to be sterile neutrino, uh, which is a, an old uh, uh, idea for, by all the theoreticians. And uh, there is a, a nice place to, to plug that in the standard model. Uh, so that's the kind of contour. This is the mixing angle, and this is the mass splitting. It turns out that there are other experiments that had kind of strange anomalies at the two sigma levels. You cannot really conclude about that. Two sigma levels in uh, solar uh, detections, things like that. And nobody uh, believed in that because the reactor data were just in agreement with the prediction. And now we move the prediction and the reactor deficit is in agreement with all these strange anomalies that you had before. Okay, three sigma levels, it's not a proof, it's just tantalizing uh, <laughs> uh, hint. Uh, so there is a whole program now in the world uh, uh, trying to look for these new neutrinos. And uh, let's see, I have to stop here uh, just to tell you that um, 
uh, that's the kind of <coughs> two efforts that we are putting now on this topic, prediction and, uh, and uh, sterile neutrinos. Could it be uh, some biases in the conversion of the spectra? The, there is this article by uh, Anna Hayes that is pointing out possible sources of error in the conversion spectrum. Uh, we are working now on the, these two uh, possible contribution, the forbidden decays. I, I was telling you that when we fit with this, with this virtual branch, we use uh, a load decays. But when you look at the nuclear data, uh, there is a lot of forbidden decays. So this is the relative contribution of various decays, a load, first forbidden with delta J zero, first forbidden, etc. And you see that actually the allowed decays, they dominate at the very low energy, and then it's all about forbidden decays. And we use only virtual branches of allowed type. Is it a bias in our procedure? So we are working on that. I have no time to go into too many details. Uh, the fact, uh, the, the new input that we uh, expect on that topic is that now we have uh, some codes <coughs> that are able to compute uh, the wave functions for uh, all the nuclei <coughs> that should be able to cover most of the fission products. Uh, they are trying to predict the, the lifetime of all the beta transition, which is a very uh, difficult uh, process, and you see that they, they have quite uh, nice uh, results. They are able to put more and more nuclear effect in their, cal in, in their uh, calculations. And what's nice is that uh, we should have uh, um, at least new information from all the fission products to really see w what are the possible change in, in, uh, in, in shape from these forbidden decays. And once we have this input that will give us the reasonable range of variation of the shapes, otherwise uh, right now we do not have enough information from the nuclear uh, community, once we have the information, we can plug that in the prediction and see how it moves and what's the error. And uh, the other uh, old idea is to compute the spectrum from, from scratch uh, using the nuclear databases and put the 10,000 branches, sum, it, sum them together. And we know that one of the big um, bias in the nuclear the measurements is this uh, so-called pandemonium effect, where the, the way we measure the beta the way people measure the, the um, beta schemes before uh, they tend, there was a systematical uh, effect that tend to put two more weight on the high energy transitions, skipping all this quasi-continuum regime in most uh, transitions. And this is being corrected for. There is a short list of nuclei that do contribute a lot. You see at high energy, the, you have a few nuclei that contribute to, to, to a large part of the spectrum, and people are remeasuring re that with a total absorption uh, spectrometer techniques, and that's the kind of correction <coughs> they are putting nucleus after nucleus. You see here the beta strength distribution from ENSDF. You see with much uh, power here at high energy, and now with these new techniques, everything is, is, uh, brings down to lower energy. And that's the kind of effect you can have at high energy with one change of, for one single nucleus. This is rubidium 82, 92. You change only this, nuclear, this nucleus from red to blue <coughs> in the calculation uh, of the total spectrum. And uh, at high energy, this is the high energy part, you do see some, uh, some change. And now they are reaching a point where uh, the remaining contribution of unknown or not well measured nucleus is getting smaller and smaller in this regime here. At high energy, it's still difficult, but here we are starting to, to have a bunch of uh, real, real good data and, and maybe uh, converge uh, toward the, the, the same accuracy than the conversion procedure. Uh, one <coughs> problem that remains with this method is that even if you have the good information on all the transitions with the good shape, the good working ratios, and everything, you need to plug that with the fission yields because you need to know what what is the abundance of each fission uh, product in your reactor. And then you have to use the, the, the evaluated fission yields from different databases. And right now, uh, people are just pointing that out in the literature that if you, if you use JEF or NDEF databases, 
that's the kind of red or blue curve that you can uh, have for the prediction of the spectra. So this summation method is also sensitive to that. This is not the case for the conversion method, and that's another piece of uh, problem that we have to tackle. Okay, uh, I will just skip the, the search for uh, sterile neutrinos just to tell you, okay, there are several experiments and nice ideas to, to go further uh, with small detectors close to reactor. Uh, I will maybe just uh, point out one, um, one idea that uh, I, I think is it, pretty neat. It's this solid experiment that wants to look for the sterile neutrinos uh, very close to a reactor. And uh, the idea is to build a kind of matrix of small cubes like that. This is five centimeters by five by five. <coughs> This is plastic scintillators with optical fibers, uh, wavelength shifters, fibers that can uh, extract the light on uh, X and Y uh, direction. And one face is painted with a, uh, a layer doped with a lithium-6. So when this reaction occurs, uh, the inverse beta decays, the positron is seen in the plastic scintillator. There is light emitted and collected by the fiber. And the neutrons will uh, diffuse and uh, has a good chance to be captured by the lithium-6 and produce alpha and tritium with very different particles interacting in the detector. And you see that they have a huge separation between neutron and positron. So for, in for instance, accidental gammas, gamma plus gamma, it won't work here. They will cut it online. So they have several powerful. And you see also the, you see also the topology this is the positron and the neutron energy deposit in closed cells. If you have a one there and one there, you know it's an accidental. So there are also topological cuts possible. And so they are working on that. <coughs> and that's the main motivation is for um, looking at the, this uh, sterile neutrinos. But this is clearly one technique that could be used to develop further uh, small detector close to surface for non-proliferation. OK. And I will stop there. Uh, so we've, we've seen many things about neutrinos. It's connecting many different topics, nuclear decays uh, up to cosmology. Uh, we are now entering, uh, as I have shown, uh, with the state-of-the-art reactor experiment, a very high precision uh, uh, era in the measurement. Uh, so that was the measurement of the last mixing angle. And also increased pre precision in the prediction led to this so-called anomaly. Uh, so we have a mature um, detection technology that uh, allowed to make first experiment uh, with the motivation of uh, surveillance of reactor for the non-proliferation. And so there are quite a bunch of uh, effort in various uh, countries now to go further, especially uh, I have shown this uh, new detection uh, technologies. Um, and the last piece of, uh, of uh, information we are, we are working on is this, um, all this information from the, from, from the nuclear databases. The comparison of measurements and absolute prediction is now reaching a high level of uh, accuracy. And that provides a quite sensitive probe to the quality of nuclear data. And uh, we have identified the key, some key issues. And uh, there are experimental programs and collaboration with theoreticians to make the thing move. and. Uh, I guess it would be useful to uh, so many people to have this corrected data. And uh, whatever is the prediction right or wrong, is the neutrino sterile there or not? Within the next three years, we will have uh, up to five or six different experiments in the world looking at these spectra very close to the, dete to the detector. And so we will have, as we will see big patterns of oscillation, so that's Nobel Prize uh, st sterile neutrino is there. Or we don't see anything, but we have at least the measurement of the shape of the spectrum, and we can uh, have new inputs about this uh, accurate prediction. Thank you.